Fake news and disinformation have polarized Filipino society, threatening to destroy its democratic values. They utilized a huge portion of that ill-gotten wealth to pay social media influencers. In the Philippines, anyone could be recruited to become a troll. Disinformation is also disrupting the global fight against climate change. Climate disinformation has moved on from straight up denial and now are using a host of tricks. The monetization of climate misinformation shows how the main priority of these companies is profit. Some commentators have uh, called the Philippines patient zero in the uh, global disinformation epidemic. November 2013, Super Typhoon Haiyan makes landfall at Tacloban in northern Philippines. Winds of up to 185 kilometers per hour batter the coastal town. Journalist Jim Eds documents the unfolding calamity. A month later, more than 6,300 people have been killed. A further 28,000 are injured. Typhoon Haiyan survivors file a petition at the Philippines Human Rights Commission against those causing climate change. Clarice Fortaleza is the officer in charge of the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Center. The petitioners framed climate change as a human rights issue. Or we cited the American Petroleum Institute and ExxonMobil. Um, these two uh, petroleum companies actually helped create several coalitions to debunk global warming the Competitive Enterprise uh, Institute had two uh, TV advertisements. Uh, the specific tagline was, they call it pollution, we call it life. Paid editorial articles of the New York Times, the advertisements actually lead uh, into or aim to mislead the public about climate science. What do you think are the changes in your community or in the physical environment? that contributed to the worsening uh, weather disturbance in Aplomancy. Their investigation finds 47 oil companies not only fueling the climate crisis, but spreading climate change disinformation. That fossil fuel industry, including the carbon majors, are utilizing measures to convince the public that their products will not lead to any significant harm to the climate system. They want to slow down the transition from a fossil fuel to a clean energy or renewable resources. In our opinion, they should be liable for disinformation. We hear about climate scientists, whatever that is. Social media sites are flooded with the climate scam hashtag that's aiding and promoting denialist and conspiratorial climate change content. So if Obama really believed that the ocean was rising, why did he just buy a $20 million waterfront home on Martha's Vineyard? Yeah, the climate change is working out great for Greta. Up in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, it's been like minus 60. The people started turning up their heat so much. Oil and gas. Yeah, because that's what's keeping us warm. The Climate Action Against Disinformation investigate and finds that the hashtag is linked to fossil fuel entities. They believe more than 4 million US dollars are spent on ads 
to spread misleading claims against the climate crisis. Climate change exacerbates inequalities and also vulnerabilities, especially of the disadvantaged and marginalized and vulnerable sectors of society. The Philippines is the fourth most vulnerable in the world and second in Southeast Asia. If we continue to misinform the public about it, they will fall even deeper into poverty. By 2050, climate change is expected to cause 250,000 additional deaths per year from undernutrition, malaria, diarrhea, and heat stress alone. Climate change disinformation is only going to make matters worse, a concern shared by the United Nations. For decades, the fossil fuel industry has spent billions of dollars on efforts to derail climate action, and they're still doing it today. Climate disinformation has moved on from straight up denial and now are using a host of tricks. Um, we call them the four Ds, delayism, deflection, division, and doomism. Delayism kicks the can down the road. It presents fossil fuels as the only practical solution we have to meet energy demand. Deflection involves a range of tricks, including greenwashing. Division seeks to silence the voices of those demanding action. Finally, doomism pushes the idea that it's already too late and that there is no point in trying. False information and the politicization of science are key barriers to climate action, according to the IPCC report 2022. It's impeding climate action, making it more difficult for climate activists around the globe. Yet another typhoon devastates my country. That's why Filipino activists like Mitzi Janelle Tan are standing in the way of climate change disinformation. The Philippines stands to lose 6% of its GDP annually by the year 2100 if it disregards climate change risks. The monetization of climate misinformation really shows you how the main priority of these companies is profit. More and more civil society and people are taking these big polluters to court, and especially countries like the Philippines and the Global South, countries that are historically have been colonized. We need to strengthen our people's resilience to fake news and false news by providing quality and accessible education that's free, and also ensuring that climate education is part of that curriculum that's institutionalized, that it's contextualized to the experience of Filipinos or wherever it is that you're from. Often shared on social media, misleading narratives questioning the effectiveness of climate solutions are spreading fast. A 2023 study shows that 96% of Filipinos are concerned about disinformation and blame traditional media, its own government, and social media influencers. Gabriel Bilonis Jr. is a Filipino technologist based in New York. He wants to ensure his countrymen have the tools to counter fake news. Bilonis runs an independent alliance amongst young tech professionals called the Break the Fake Movement. Fighting disinformation and promoting digital literacy is not a technology problem. It is really a problem about access to education in general. So the data stories here in the Philippines are published in English. For the past seven years, we have been launching different types of events, competitions, fact-checking summits, academies, webinars, and what have you, to be able to promote critical thinking and positive participation in online spaces and MIL, or Media and Information Literacy. Good morning, everybody. Gabriel's vision is to build a community of media and information literate Filipinos. So what we'll have to do as a society? Citizens equipped with critical thinking abilities to debunk disinformation and strengthen democratic institutions. 
one of the most effective methodologies we do is train the trainers in a way that we're using civic education as an approach to be able to democratize access to media and information literacy. So we run fact-checking academies, we run leadership development programs, we teach them about how to fact-check, we teach them how to run digital literacy, how to navigate through your algorithms, what are the different kinds of threats and actors available online like scammers, cyber bullies, and predators, and what have you, and be able to save safely navigate through online spaces and positively participate in this particular spaces. As activists and their communities fight for the truth, a troubling trend gains momentum in Filipino politics, veering towards historical revisionism. Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos Jr. becomes the 17th president of the Philippines. He defeats runner-up Lenny Robredo with a grand margin of 30%. It's a landslide victory. Marcos wins 58% of the popular vote, becoming the first majority president since 1986. It marks the end of an election campaign that focused on regaining the lost glory of the Marcos family. And social media is used to great effect to win the hearts and minds of millions of Filipinos. The Marcos Jr. campaign in 2022 saw social media as a potent force, not only to uh, mobilize voter support, but to somehow insanitize the supposed dark legacies of the Marcos dictatorship and to somehow uh, present themselves as viable political alternatives. He would intone, my name is Ferdinand Marcos of Batak. When Filipinos deposed the Marcos, the Marcoses in 1986, of course, the overwhelming judgment is that they have committed serious, serious crimes uh, to, the, to the people. Uh, and unfortunately, the cases against the Marcoses have not made such progress. Therefore, the lack of justice and accountability somehow provided the Marcoses with the foundation that it can cosmetize the martial law legacy. The Marcos election campaign focused on Gen Z-friendly platforms like TikTok. Their aim was to solidify the Marcos family's place in people's hearts, beyond promoting Bong Bong's candidacy for president. But the campaign was overtaken by a deluge of fake news and misleading claims. Random YouTube accounts claimed that 17th century French astrologer Nostradamus had predicted Marcos Jr. would win the presidency. That was followed up with anonymous accounts claiming that the Marcos family inherited tons of gold, which would be redistributed if they returned to power. Keeping a check on such political disinformation was the team at Verifiles, a Manila-based nonprofit fact-checking organization. Celine Sampson, is the head of its online verification unit. In the last elections, uh, we saw the rise of short-form videos being used um, to, to further disinformation. TikTok was used, um, a more glossy, pop, fun style, um, to push support um, for the Marcos administration video of Imelda Marcos staring up um, and there was dramatic music played in the background as if to try to grab sympathy for the Marcoses. During the 2022 elections, Verifiles debunked 336 viral social media posts from January 1st to December 10th. 
52 of the online posts specifically distorted facts about Ferdinand Marcos Sr. The Marcos family benefited a lot from misinformation and disinformation. Historical distortionism that the era of the Marcos dictatorship um, in the 1970s and the 1980s was the golden era of the Philippines, that there were no human rights violations committed under Mar the Marcos era. There was no corruption um, during the Marcos dictatorship, all of which are false claims. Misinformation campaigns also targeted the opposition. The biggest victims of this information was Lenny Robredo, the former vice president. Statements that make her look like she's not making sense, or tries to make her look stupid. Um, it was a tactic used against her repeatedly. <laughs> We've seen videos whose audio was changed. We fact-checked. It replaced the audio with an audio of supporters chanting, Marcos, Marcos. Gendered disinformation attacks linking sexually explicit material to Aki Robredo, daughter of Lenny, added another dimension to the race. It really ran the gamut from um... Uh, attempts to discredit her, fake news about her family, uh, her daughters, her uh, her brother-in-law, uh, attempting to link them to, uh, to, to criminal activity, to drugs, to to abuse of power, and all that. None of which were were actually uh, true. Kung may kumpiansa sa pamumuno, papasok ang puhunan. Some commentators have uh, called the Philippines patient zero in the uh, global disinformation epidemic. Our elections since 2016 onward have really been characterized by a huge amount of troll, trolling, uh, fake news, uh, disinformation, and what we now call influence operations. Obviously, Rodrigo Duterte was uh, one of the first and earliest beneficiaries of this. Uh, to a certain extent, the Marcoses also. Unfortunately, uh, Philippine society, to a large extent, is still very much, very, very patriarchal. And so, attacks on a person's gender, they get traction. That's really the, uh, the existential threat to, uh, to democracy that, that, that we are facing. The election campaign left millions with a massive trust deficit. Today, 51% of Filipinos find it difficult to spot fake news on social media. The sheer intensity of disinformation on the web forced Verifiles to produce a podcast targeting younger audiences. So basically, they're trying to promote accountability within the ranks of journalists. Yung iba ay ano talaga? very hindi responsible hindi nagve-verify kung tama ba yung sinasabi ng source nila or hindi it shows na yung peer making na impact so ano bang problem sa pagkalat ng mis and disinformation there are a lot it can cause confusion but political fact checking in the Philippines has come at a cost verifiles has faced intimidation and censorship because of its critical analysis and exposure of false narratives. One of the uh, more serious attacks we've received um, came in 2019 during the midterm elections when Vera Files and its pres our president, Ellen Tordesillas, was put in the middle of a matrix or a map of organizations and individuals supposedly seeking to oust then President Rodrigo Duterte. And in the Philippines, unofficially, if you're tagged as a communist, you're also seen as a terrorist, basically. I'd say one of the most harmful um, outcomes of political polarization. Unraveling the damage caused by fake news and disinformation may take years. Carl Suyat, co-founded Project Gunita, a non-profit dedicated to countering the historical revisionism 
of the Marcos martial law years. The blueprint that the Marcos campaign followed was the blueprint of the Duterte campaign of 2016. Uh, Rodrigo Duterte was the first president, at least in this country, uh, who was elected using Cambridge Analytica and using the manipulation of social media algorithms and social, social media use in general to capture a popular or a populist uh, vote. It, it's, basically, it's basically the same example and actually the same machinery that, that uh, President Marcos Jr. now uh, had utilized in his presidential campaign in 2022. For Carl, there's a mountain to climb. He believes the Marcos' online revisionism project dates back to the 2000s through the family's presence on Friendster, Flickr, and other now defunct websites. It's a no-brainer to say that they utilized a huge part or huge portion of that ill-gotten wealth to pay social media influencers, uh, to saturate social media with pro-Marcos content, with content that distorts uh, Philippine history, particularly the martial law years, um, and to basically create this online infrastructure or social media infrastructure of disinformation and historical distortion, which made Marcos more popular with the public. Carl is digitizing books, documents, magazines, and newspapers from the martial law era to preserve the historical truths about the Philippines. Uh, a lot of people were massacred, taken away, detained, tortured, and hundreds of thousands were displaced in different barrios around Visayas and Mindanao uh, as a result of this uh, hamleting operations by the military. Of course, there were killings, there were extrajudicial killings, the most famous of which would be the 1983 assassination or quote-unquote salvaging of uh, Nino Aquino at the Manila International Airport. Uh, sa headquarters, yung headquarters ng MPD sa Manila. Tapos yung susunod ay, ay ito si, si Father Brian Gore. The Marcos campaign, the Marcos PR campaign specifically, banked on national amnesia. And that so-called truism of Filipinos being forgiving. No, look, I don't want to talk about this anymore. If you do, I'm going to walk out. Confronting historical lies in cyberspace is a battle being fought on Wikipedia too. This edit war is currently being waged by a loose band of activists in the midst of an information brawl. It's led by Josh Lim, the co-founder of the Wiki Society of the Philippines. We've seen this in edits involving um, downplaying some of the atrocities of martial law. And what we've noticed is even our even non-Filipino editors have had an interest in why are we calling, for example, Ferdinand Marcos a kleptocrat in quotation marks. Now, the historical record shows that with all, you know, with all due respect, he was. It's an intense battle for the truth. On average, more than 376 edits are made on the Ferdinand Marcos Sr. Wikipedia page every year. So I remember an editor called The Truth 16, and this editor was particularly insistent in sanitizing, if you will, the article on Ferdinand Marcos. Normally, these edits, if there is vandalism on Wikipedia, we're very good at reverting that very quickly. Um, especially if it's related to topics that are either controversial or they're topics that everybody knows about. But what we have noticed is um, increasingly over the last few years, people have become more sophisticated in um, hiding their edits so that they can escape detection more easily. As digital activists work to uncover the factual history of their country, deeper scars from disinformation continue to haunt the nation. June 30th, 2016, presidential candidate Rodrigo Duterte sweeps the polls in one of the strongest political campaigns ever seen in Philippine history. Once in power, he unleashes the war on drugs, cleansing Filipino society from the evils of drug use. 
campaign against drugs will not stop until the last pudder and the last drug lord are <laughs> But it's engulfed in a wave of extrajudicial killings across the country. Amnesty International believes more than 7,000 suspects are killed in 233,000 drug operations from 2016 to 2022. Human Rights Watch condemns the killings, exposing the police for falsifying evidence to justify unlawful murders. To counter negative public opinion, a deluge of fake news overruns Facebook. I think the first point of disinformation during the uh, war, of, war on drugs uh, implemented by the Duterte administration is there is no clear uh, n numbers as to the casualties it's because they don't deserve basic human rights. They don't deserve even basic human dignity as uh, part of the disinformation is to somehow uh, mention that a lot of those who were killed uh, deserved uh, their fate. The fear factor behind the war on drugs has been somehow equated with effective governance. That the Duterte administration is finally accomplishing what previous governments were unable to do so. In 2017, a University of Oxford report unearths how 200,000 US dollars were used by Duterte to hire thousands of trolls. Their mission? to target Duterte's opponents or those criticizing his war on drugs with cyber harassment. Senator Leela de Lima is target number one for filing a Senate petition and demanding answers for the use of state funds for hiring trolls. A wave of cyber attacks are unleashed against de Lima. From deep fake porn videos to trolls calling for her death. The crux of the matter is, if I do not talk about that relationship with the limit of a driver, then there is no topic to talk about. She's arrested in 2017 for allegedly receiving drug proceeds from a driver after a vicious online troll campaign. But the truth is, I was protector of the beloved drug lords. But the truth is, I was the only Justice Secretary since the 1986 Elsa Revolution who dared to eradicate the dominion of the drug lords inside Bilibid. I teach criminal law at the University of the Philippines. This is the only drug case I've seen where there was not a single gram of drugs presented as evidence. When Duterte was no longer in power, uh, cr the, the allegations crumbled when the people who supposedly first executed affidavits testifying against De Lima, all started recanting. Very clearly, the only reason why Senator Laila De Lima spent almost seven years in jail was Duterte wanted her there. Senator De Lima is released seven years later. We at last, after six years, eight months, 21 days. One group in particular that's blamed for the rise in vitriolic political trolling is the die-hard Duterte supporters, a loose band of political extremists known for their reverence to former President Duterte. We track down one member of the DDS in Davao City. Thirty-nine-year-old Russell Dave Abellana is a rapper who goes by the name of Cole Sheep. His rap songs are dedicated to the former president's war on drugs. I am a die-hard Duterte supporter, and I have helped him in social media through. Hindi naman pangaaway, minsan lang. Many people don't understand his ways, his iron fist. And during his campaign, last 2016, uh, meron talagang pagkakataon, pagkakataon, medyo marami din na, na napapalaban tayo, napapaaway tayo through posts, comments. Minsan, nagme-message din. 
uh, pag napikon na talaga, tao lang din tayo na may pikon. Tsaka alam din natin eh, na mali yung uh, pinagsasabi nila. Russell works at a local restaurant and uses the internet in his free time to protect and defend Rodrigo Duterte in cyberspace. Biktima siya ng fake news a lot of times. So, many fake news that we see on social media against him, I don't know if who's making it, but we know that it's fake news. Yaman, tagong yaman daw niya, yung mga pagpatay, which is not proven. Sometimes, no, um, when we post uh, about Duterte on social media, um, some trolls, they call it keyboard warriors nila, they hijack your post, they comment negative things. So, minsan, nagalit din tayo as, as Duterte supporter, um, nagalit din tayo, nakaka-answer tayo ng hindi maganda or or medyo below the belt din. In the global war on truth, people like Russell can easily be influenced into spreading fake news. Nearly 99% of the country's population has access to social media, but 51% of Filipinos find it difficult to identify fake news on television, radio, or social media. It's a real talent and skill of populist politicians to really understand and address the fears and anxieties of communities, of people who feel disenfranchised, those who have real grievances, who feel they have been left behind by society, right? Like these are the marginalized, these are people who are not part of the mainstream. Social media are very easy for um, to create groups, to create communities, to have online fandoms um, dedicated to, you know, amplifying and sharing their same sets of anxieties and grievances, to exchange their fears about the future, and therefore, it's easy to be exchanging these kinds of sentiments online. It's an industry with millions to be made and lost. One study found that influencers with 10,000 followers in the Philippines could earn a monthly retainer of 5,800 to 6,800 US dollars during election season. One of the alarming findings of my research is that anyone could be recruited to become a troll. They could be anyone. They could be my former student. They could be your friend. Trolling is actually very creative work. It involves creating strategies. It involves understanding people's anxieties and resentments about establishment politicians or even their um, trust in mainstream media. The psychological impact of such trolls cuts even deeper. An NYU study examined 560,000 tweets. It found that for every moral emotional word a tweet contained, retweet increased by 20%. The cognitive structures surrounding trolling or spreading fake news drives people to feel good by belonging to a group. Correcting false narratives through a fact check often fails to rectify the effects of fake news, according to Trisha Zafra. She's a former journalist who left her career to study psychology. Being corrected for something that you believe as true can be uncomfortable or unpleasant, so it can feel like as if you are being attacked, and that can cause you to feel anxiety. So for people to avoid feeling anxiety about that, they would tend to resist correction, especially if the correction is done in a way that is aloof or in a way that is impersonal or condescending. Fact-checking false information on the web requires a greater level of empathy for those who have fallen into the traps of fake news. We need to acknowledge that it is not the audience's fault that there is fake news and false information and that they're actually victims. That could be because misinformation had served a purpose or a function in the person's psychological or emotional life. So even if the misinformation 
has been corrected, it would be really hard to eliminate its influence from a person's psychological life because it had served a function in the past. The task of reversing the impact of group thinking has become even more complex since the advent of artificial intelligence. Siwei Lu is a University of Buffalo professor who specializes in detecting deep fakes and other digital forgeries. What concerns me is this erosion of trust of the user to all the media we're seeing on social media. And in, in, throughout my research um, in this area, what I realize is the most important defense for us against the deep fakes are the high, the, the elevated level of awareness. So this is, again, the deep fake video of Elon Musk. A simple way to, put, to expose this is looking at the uh, signal of the audio. And uh, we realize that the whole audio signal of Elon Musk's speech have no breathing sound in between them, and that is not possible. Limiting the impact of fake news means curbing its ability to go viral. The recommendation algorithm is the profit-making engine for all the social media platforms. The more articles I read, the more chance that I will spend time on the advertisement that's embedded into those contents. The uh, recommendation algorithms are by their very nature driven by the user's habit. There needs a lot of transparency and also regulations of how our data are exactly being used. As the global battle to fight fake news continues, a new movement to target the young takes root in rural Philippines. December 2023. A Philippine boat and a Chinese Coast Guard ship collide near a hotly contested territorial reef in the West Philippine Sea. Beijing claims the Philippine vessel provoked the Chinese vessel in this disputed waterway, calling it a dangerous and provocative act. The internet transforms into a battleground of narratives with fake news at the heart of this geopolitical flashpoint. PHTV, a YouTube channel, uses old imagery to propel Beijing's narrative, painting the Chinese boat as the victim. The National Task Force for West Philippine Sea is quick to respond at sea and on the internet. We noticed that a lot of people in the Philippines started debating no? about this issue, and we felt that the Philippines was falling into a trap. And this is the, precisely the disinformation trap uh, that was uh, lodged by Beijing against the Philippines. Philstar.com relays this fact check on its website before Chinese influence operations inside the Philippines can take effect. Heading their online editorial, is Rosette Adele, who routinely trains her team to maintain vigilance against such influence operations. So what is influence operations? These are the coordinated spread of um, misleading or malicious narratives that uh, can tend to spread and sway the public opinion. Rosette believes irresponsible content creators have made journalism more challenging in the Philippines. Fake news really impacted uh, the current uh, journalism or media landscape because the proliferation of fake news divided the audience. Many are now relying on influencers, vloggers, who do not know the process of verification. Unlike journalists, we undergo rigorous process of gathering information and um, verifying them because we have uh, ethics. Trolling in cyberspace has also had an impact on free speech in the country. The Philippines is now ranked 132nd among 180 countries in the latest World Press Freedom Index. 
Due to years of anti-media discourse, harassment, and delegitimization of media, 40% of Filipinos identified journalists themselves as sources of false and manipulative content. Journalists in the Philippines experience various forms of online harassment. So there's cyberbullying, trolls, there are threats. So we have a running joke actually that we eat the threats for breakfast because we really do. Like we receive messages um, from trolls or even real persons who are threatening us and even it go as far as personal attacks. Living with fake news is the new reality in the Philippines, and children are an easy target. According to a 2021 study, kids often start believing in unproven conspiratorial theories on the internet at the age of 14. That's what motivated Joey Cruz to design a curriculum for younger generations of Filipinos. It's very crucial that we start uh, teaching our children how to be more intelligent online, how to be more critical online, because uh, personally, I'm also a parent. We all know children these days are susceptible, vulnerable to so many, so many threats online. Ayon, meron, 13-year-old hospitalized, burned after imitating TikTok video. That is why we came up with the term or hashtag Digitalino. The ASEAN Digital Innovation Project, or Digitalino, focuses on workshops designed to teach digital literacy to underserved sectors. It's just a two-hour training. They go through a series of adventures, a series of journeys, and then we injected lessons you know, on digital literacy along the way. Another topic is understanding your own biases. We also have imposter content, uh, which means they would just use, for example, a photo of a prominent personality and then put a quotation you know, beside it, and then suddenly it would uh, look like official or legit. The Digital Lino program has now reached more than 30,000 children across far-flung areas like Tacloban. Children at the Sokod Elementary School will be trained to fight against disinformation and fake news today. Claire Fernandez is a master trainer who volunteers with the program to educate children about the threats they face from disinformation. About the Digitalino, 51% of Filipinos find it difficult to spot fake news. Learn how to combine misinformation and disinformation by providing digital literacy training to students like you. So fake news and disinformation can be confusing and scary to children. So this can distort their ideas and basically lead them even to anxiety and depression. It can erode their trust in adults, especially right now children, they just love to share content without even checking it out, the details. Is this information real or not? Folding phone while using Gcash may cause money to lose value. Is it true or false? <laughs> oh, Stefan, pakita ko to ito, Dere. Dere, ganun bang baka niya? Ano ka to? So we really want to equip them, educate them on how to spot this misinformation, disinformation, and at the same time make them responsible citizens to help others also. We designed this program even for teachers, educators, and also from the national government offices. Um, if kids are responsible, they will be the ones to share even to their parents to help with their circle of friends, their families. In 2016, Research conducted by Stanford University involving 8,000 students found that nearly 80% believed an advertisement labeled as sponsored content was a factual news story. 
cyberbullying using altered pictures and videos amongst children is another growing issue. One study suggests 38% of social media users experience cyberbullying on a daily basis. That's why these workshops for children are of critical importance in a country like the Philippines. Back in my elementary days, I've been also a victim of fake news and all this cyberbullying. So right now, I just want to give back and help these kids be responsible citizens and at the same time also behave, give respect to other people, especially those who are vulnerable. They fake post new challenges. They can create increasingly realistic and believing information. So it's really making it more crucial for us to really fight this type of threats. So we hope that these kids, they'll just use tech for good and be a digitally or responsible citizens. More than 51% of Filipinos find it difficult to spot fake news in the media, forcing legislators in the country to push for stringent laws. But grassroots activists believe the only constitutional means to fight fake news is spreading more facts. Battles against an infodemic have taken root in the Philippines, but the war is expected to be a long and arduous one. It will take years to heal the psychological and physical scars of fake news before the truth finally wins.